For Krima Media in Johannesburg, I'm Sane Lamini. Joining me today is Erica Teplange to discuss her book titled Run for the Love of Life. So Erica, the book is about your experience uh, while running on the harshest landscapes on earth, I must say. Can you briefly tell us how your passion for running started? I started running when I was 30 years old. And before that, I worked 18 hour days focusing on my corporate career, perhaps not spending as much time on my health as I hoped to spend um, and as I should have spent. And then when I started taking up running, and it was a very interesting, a friend of mine invited me to come and do a half marathon. Um, it was the worst experience of my life <laughs> uh, because it was immediate and it was very uh, strenuous. But I found something in that experience that was quite extraordinary. And then I was introduced to the sport of adventure racing. And I went straight from being a non-athlete to literally a sport where you are sometimes on your feet for five days and five nights without sleeping. Um, and I eventually went to the adventure racing uh, world champs in New Zealand um, with the sport. But the interesting thing was during this period, I discovered that my whole life came into alignment when I started running. I started doing better at work. My relationships improved. My friendships improved. My impact in the community improved. My gravitas at work. Um, you know, when you run across the deserts and you run for hundreds and hundreds of miles or you face your darkest fears in the middle of the night and um, running through the night, it's very easy to present to the executive team and the board. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and Erica, your teacher told you that you are a good storyteller. I enjoyed how you wrote about your Egypt trip that almost never happened. Can you briefly share what happened in Egypt? <laughs> yeah, so in the Sahara Desert, like I said, I, I did adventure racing and then for many years I didn't uh, do any competitive sport um, after the adventure racing. And then I discovered trail running and I really needed to go to Egypt. I was coming through a very difficult time of my life. And Sonia, you will know, having read the book, that that is the message of the book, that being active and being healthy, it sounds so trite, but supports us through the most difficult times in our life. It supports us through divorce, through difficulties at work, through uh, grief. You know, it, it helps us. And so I was going through a very difficult time in my life. And I felt so drawn to the Sahara Desert because, you know, that's the place where the prophets went um, when they got the download. Um, that's where Jesus went. That's where Muhammad went. That's, you know, it seems that the desert was, was quite a beautiful place and quite a spiritual place in which to, to heal. And then... Um, I signed up for a seven-day ultra marathon with Racing the Planet. And it's 250 kilometers that you run over seven days, but you carry everything on your back. Um, so all your food for seven days, your sleeping bag, your medicine, your clothing. Um, and then you get to run through this pristine, extraordinary place. Um, yeah, so the Sahara was, was probably the most. And I won the race. I had no idea I had it in me. But I won the race and it was quite profound. But also um, something about intention. I was so sure that I needed to go and do this race, whether I ran it or crawled it. Um, and I almost didn't get there uh, because of difficulties with flights and not having a visa. Um, but everything worked out in the end. But I'll leave the story. It's a good story about I find how I finally arrived in, <laughs> in the Sahara against all odds. But I'll leave it for the readers to discover. And you also say that the, the Sahara race had begun a lifelong affair with long distance running. Tell us about that. Yeah, so after the Sahara race, because um, it was such a peak experience in my life. And um, because... You know, the camaraderie on these races is just extraordinary and the degree to which you connect with other people and understand that there's so much more that unites us than what separates us. And 
having these intimate uh, connections, but concentrated in seven days and life being so simple. You just have your little backpack and you run with just that. And you realize how little we actually need um, to be happy and that the answer is not in more and more material stuff. And of course, your body feels incredible. You feel like an invincible Spartan warrior. And the, there is no limit. You know, you can do anything you put your, your mind to. So that becomes such a template for life that after the Sahara race, I had to do it again. And over the next 10 years, I then ran in so many different places in the world. I ran in the Atacama Desert many places in Turkey, in the UK, in Utah, in the US. And every time, in every race, there would be something so extraordinary and magnificently otherworldly, different to normal life, mm. that you would come back in a way transformed, you know? So, so I ran for the past 10, 12 years. I've ran all over the world. I've run, won many races. I've lost many races. Um, but that's not really the reason I run. I run to go and see what is there. And as an author, my job is then to distill out from what is there and bring it back to people on the couch where they are um, so that they don't have to go and run 250 kilometers when it's 50 degrees Celsius. Um, sure. but, I, but I do make the point that everybody should have some form of physical activity in their life. You have also, Erica, participated in, in so many races that you've just told us, but which one stood out for you and why? Yeah, so um, people often ask me this question, um, and it's a very hard one to answer because every single race has a particular peak experience um, and a different thing that you learn perhaps about yourself, and there's always some growth that happens but you know, Sonny, the, the races that stood out for me is probably um, the last one I did in South Africa, uh, the Ukrabis Extreme Marathon, uh, 250 kilometers, um, also over seven days. And I mean, the temperatures, if you can imagine the hottest day you've been in for the past 10 years and just add 10 degrees Celsius on top of that, because now you're in the desert, you cannot get away from the heat. It is all engulfing. And, and it was an extremely hard race because I had just come into menopause. Mm. Right, literally a few months before the race, um, I went into the change of life. And women don't talk about this often enough. And I really spoke about it in my book because I want uh, people to talk about it more so that there is more support for women out there. Um, when this happens, you know, the wisdom of other women who've, who've walked the path. But anyway, so it was an incredibly hard race for me because physically it was harder on every level. The estrogen was gone. The progesterone was gone. The, the um, serotonin and dopamine that goes with it. It was like uh, racing the Tour de France on a bicycle with just on the rims with no tires. It was like that. <laughs> And the, the pride I felt in, in myself for not giving up when it was extremely hard. Um, it was probably my peak race, my hardest race by far, but it was my peak race and something that I'm grateful for at this late stage of my life, um, having been able to participate in. And I, and I intend to continue until I'm 80, perhaps 85. If they'll allow a Zimmer frame on the race, I will go with that. <laughs> uh, you've, you've highlighted briefly that you've also ran in Turkey. So in the book, I read about the Run Fire Capedonia race, and you said it impacted your own life as well as the women who were watching at the finish line. Tell us oh. about that moment. Oh, my sister. Honestly, it was extraordinary because um, Turkey had just been part of a coup. Um, and you know that Turkey was on a journey of emancipation where women had more equal rights 
um, there was more education for women, women were allowed to work. And in the trail running community, you could feel that spirit, um, the men celebrating the women coming in and the women understanding that their bodies are profoundly powerful. They can also run 250 kilometers carrying everything they need. And there was such a joy in Turkey around this new way of being. And on Runfire Cappadocia at that race, literally two weeks before, a week before, I can't exactly remember, there was a coup um, by the president who is very conservative and against um, the emancipation of Turkey in such a way. Um, and I decided to still go, um, a half of the international entrance because of the, the fear of the coup and the security risk uh, didn't go to the race. But I decided to still go to the race. So there were lots, mostly Turkish participants. And during the race, I encountered perhaps the most naive and um, innocent, I want to say innocent um, sexism on the even on the field and I I completely forgive the guys because I understand that's where the soup they grew up in so how how could they suddenly behave differently long story short um a young man on the way to the race said to me Erica this is a man's world he even played me the song he played me the song on the bus as we were driving to um the 100 kilometer stage so the person who wins a 100-kilometer stage on a seven-day race is actually the person who wins the race because that's where the true grit is. And as he played me the song that this is a man's world, so now I remember in my body something coming online that wasn't for me. It was for all the women in the world that are being oppressed. And I ran that race and I started going past one First, I went past all the women, and then I started going past the guy who was in fifth position, and then in fourth, and then in third. And I came past the young man who, he actually called me Omar, which is grandma, um, <laughs> during the race. And I passed him and his friend, and then I passed the front runner. And I was the front person in that race. That night, it was just at sunset that was coming across the finish line actually just dusk all the Turkish women had gathered because they had heard that a woman was leading the race and when I broke that line I broke that line for all the women in Turkey they went berserk with joy with pride with celebration and the men on that finish line together with the women because I also think they wanted a way a different world because when there's oppression it's not just the oppressed that suffers. The oppressor suffers as much. They just don't know it. So there, there was something about a joy that a woman had won this race. I'll never forget. That was probably the, the high moment in my racing career was when I broke the line for, for, for Turkey, for the Turkish women, for the Turkish men, uh, for women all over the world. Um, we can, you know. We can. So, Erica, I've also found out that you are a founder now of a teacher girl to fish in Greece. Tell us about this adventure company that uh, mainly assists women. I started Teach a Girl to Fish because, Sane, I understood what uh, being physical and being in nature did for my success in my life, my success and my happiness. And I really wanted to bring that, especially to, you know, in my dream mind, I had the idea of um, coming to the 14 to 18 year old bracket of girls and to take them out into the wilderness to let them experience their own power, their own strength, their ability to, to be um, resilient. So that was the dream. So I started Teach a Girl to Fish, which is, um, it became a kayaking company in Greece. And then I discovered that I was attracting lots of housewives, lots of women from corporates, sort of your between 35 and 55, people who needed a break. And I would have 
Um, and, you know, and, and I did many trips with guys as well and with mixed groups, husbands and wives. You have no idea how good kayaking is for couples therapy, but not on the first day. <laughs> not on the first day. <laughs> and then a lot of women um, approached me and said they wanted to come. And the company actually grew organically. And um, as women were coming on these adventures and we would literally take our boats and pack our belongings for the week for five days. And I would say two shoe boxes full only. And people would arrive with these big trolley suitcases and they'd look at me and say, No, I'm not hearing you right. Yes, two shoe boxes only. And then eventually when they reunited with the with the uh, trolley suitcase, at the end of five days on that beautiful a sparkling Greek agency. And having lived so simply together in close community, paddling from island to island or taverna to taverna, they suddenly understand that same message as what we experienced in the desert. You need little to be happy. And because there are no mirrors, you know, we don't look at ourselves in the mirror, but people get more and more beautiful every day because they're outside, they're drinking enough water, they're physically active. We go to bed when the sun goes down. We go get up when the sun comes up. So we get back into our natural um, circadian rhythm. So something beautiful happens. And I think when one begins to forget about how you have to show up or what you have to look like, or and you just begin to play again like a child and just enjoy um, something beautiful. There's a beautiful transformation that happens, you know. So these kayaking trips... Um, we would run it for five days. And the most beautiful thing that you would see at the end of it is that a woman would come into the kayaking trip afraid. At the end of it, she had kayaked 80 kilometers on the open sea. She'd be walking on water six foot tall like a warrior. She would leave that ship. And I know it would go into the rest of her life as it did for many people who came on the trips. And lastly, Erica, what else would you say the readers will get uh, from your book? Right. Hopefully, number one, I just want to, that's why I tell all the stories. I just want people to get up off the couch and do one small thing twice a week, three times a week, maybe even four. Get active because it makes you smarter. It makes you more creative. It makes you kinder. Um, and I mean, I can talk about all the science that backs it up. Just move, move regularly. And if you are struggling at the end of my book, um, I've got a free link to a Facebook page where I've uploaded 20 years of my running experience. And I've built a couch to three kilometer and a couch to five kilometer and a couch to 10K program so that people can download it for free. It is so simple to follow and it is so it's detailed enough and simple enough that anybody can become their own coach, but even better, take a friend with you, do it together, um, because you will serve the rest of your life that way. There was Erica Teplange speaking to Krima Media's Polity about her book titled Run for the Love of Life.